looking at the future. Good evening and welcome to the City Council meeting of the City of Lenore for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019. We welcome you here this evening and as we normally do as we get started, we will be, uh, just a minute, we'll rise for our moment of silence and we'll remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. As we go to that time, uh, we would like for you to continue to keep the uh, family of our, our own dear uh, Lou Ann Kincaid in your thoughts and prayers as uh, uh, Lou Ann passed away, as you know, a week or two ago. And uh, we would like to keep her family in our thoughts and prayers very, very untimely and, and uh, quite unexpected. And uh, we know that they are still in uh, struggling with it. So please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And now please join us as we rise for our moment of silence and our national uh, pledge of allegiance. Thank you. Please salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, our first item tonight is the, uh, we have a proclamation and uh, for that will be presented to Catawba Valley Realtors Association, proclaiming this the uh, month of April as Fair Housing Month throughout the city of Lenore and Conwell County. Come down to the podium, and I'll ask uh, Lauren Hart if she would join me at the podium. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> and I'd like to uh, present this proclamation to you for Fair Housing Month. Whereas April 11, 2019 marks the 51st anniversary of the passage of the United States Fair Housing Law, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, as amended, which emancipates a national policy of fair housing without regard to race, color, creed, national origin, sex, family status, and handicap, and encourages fair housing opportunities for all citizens. <clears throat> and whereas the Catawba Valley Association of Realtors is committed to highlighting the Fair Housing Law, Title VIII of the Civil Rights, Act, Civil Rights Act of 1968, by continuing to address discrimination in our community, supporting programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and planning partnership efforts with other organizations to help assure every American of their right to fair housing. Now, therefore, I, as mayor of the city of Lenore, North Carolina, and on behalf of Lenore City Council, do hereby resolve that April 2019, being Fair Housing Month, begins a year-long commemoration of the United <coughs> States Fair Housing Law in the city of Lenore, and urge all citizens to wholeheartedly recognize this celebration throughout the year, adopted this the second day of April 2019. Thank you, and congratulations. We appreciate you bringing that to us every year, and I'd like to present that to you. with get a picture of it. On behalf of the Catawba Valley Association of Realtors, we'd like to say thank you to the city of Lenore for all of your support in fair housing. Fair housing is not just about creating opportunities for homeownership, but also allowing people of all different walks of life to access housing without fear of discrimination. As you've probably noticed, the housing market is wide open this spring with houses going under contract quickly, sometimes even with multiple offers in a matter of hours. Lenore is a thriving, happening place because of you, the city officials, its citizens, the employment opportunities, and all the varieties of activities for people of all ages. So we'd like to say thank you again on behalf of the Catawba Valley Association of Realtors. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for being with us, Lauren. We appreciate that. And we do hope uh, housing will continue to, uh, to grow in our city, and uh, we're working on a lot of ways to make that happen. So thank you for your part of, of that. 
Okay, we'll move on then to uh, tonight. Our uh, Chief of Police, uh, Chief Brent Phelps, is here to present the Police Department's annual report for 2018. Chief Phelps, welcome. Mr. Mayor, Council, City Manager, let's pull this up. Okay. How is everybody this evening? Great. Great. As this is my first one as the chief in reporting from our activities from last year. So it, it, was, a, it was a good process for me to go through, uh, go through our annual report. There is a, a lot of information in our annual report. Uh, you guys have gotten that. It'll be posted on our website. It's 35 pages. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all 35 <laughs> pages tonight. Uh, this is an overview. So there may be some things, if you look through it before, that you have questions about that are not up here, I have a copy of it, feel free to ask me. Um, or as you look through it in the future, feel free to give me a call and, and, and we'll go over it. There is our City of uh, Lenore website. Uh, you can go under our department. It'll be posted on there uh, very shortly. Starting with uh, our Part one, uh, violent crime rates. Uh, these, we were still using UCR, which is the Uniform Crime Report. Next year, that will be different. Uh, and I will talk about some of the change in our data reporting uh, in a few moments. But under the old UCR reporting code, uh, last year we had 43 reportable incidents in 18. Uh, that was a 10% reduction from 2017 for our violent crimes. Uh, in 17, we had 48 incidents, and that was a 6% reduction from 2016. So in the last two years, we've been very fortunate to see a 16% reduction in our violent crimes uh, that are reportable. And, uh, and so we're, we're proud of that part of the, uh, of the reduction. In our property crimes, I wish I could report to you it was uh, a reduction as well. There was a slight increase there. We had 883 incidents in 18. Uh, that was a 12% increase from 17. Uh, the largest area, as we analyze those numbers, the largest area uh, there that was the biggest increase was our motor vehicle thefts. Those in 17, we had 43. In 18, we had 100. Uh, we worked with uh, surrounding agencies. Unfortunately, all the surrounding agencies also saw increases. Uh, there were several meetings with our investigators, uh, with North Carolina License and Theft, uh, the Sheriff's Office, Hudson PD, Granite, Hickory. Um, we recovered more vehicles than we've ever recovered uh, in the last number of years, uh, and we made more arrests for uh, motor vehicle thefts. Uh, for, in 17, we charged eight people for motor vehicle theft. In 18, we charged 32. Uh, so our guys were working very diligently on that increase. Um, and, and there's a lot of different things where you can attribute that to. One of the things that we saw in those investigations with the motor vehicle theft specifically was as the internet has made shopping for vehicles a lot easier, where you can sit in your living room and see what uh, kind of vehicles are on lots. Uh, unfortunately, people have used that uh, to look for certain vehicles. Several of uh, specific vehicle were targeted uh, at a lot of jurisdictions. And we recovered one of those in South Carolina the night we had uh, two trucks stolen from one of our car lots. Uh, and those vehicles were being taken and taken out of the area. And so that's something we're still working with North Carolina license of theft on and DMV. Uh, but uh, that was a big part of where that increase was. Just some other police activity uh, from the police department. Our communication center, they received 35,000 phone calls last year. Uh, the folks that sit in there 12 hours a day uh, are extremely busy. Our 911 calls were, were over 5,000. Uh, that is about <clears throat> an average. Last year it was slightly over 5,000. We had a small bump in 911 calls, but uh, it was pretty consistent. Our process CAD calls were over 46,000. Some of our other activities, <coughs> our patrol division, uh, 
over 31,000 police service calls. Uh, that is a lot of interactions with, with our officers and the public. Uh, and I'll refer back to that number here in just a minute. Over 13,000 property checks by our patrol division um, and over 865 call follow-ups just from our patrol officers. So as they're getting, dealing with calls, dealing with cases, doing those follow-ups throughout the year uh, are, are very important. Our investigations division worked over 1,200 criminal cases. Uh, we had over 382 nuisance cases. Uh, that is a, a constant uh, work. Uh, we, uh, we're looking for ways to, we're at that point, uh, and when I was in uh, the chief's process, this was one of the things that came up from the, uh, the board. I think we're doing case, nuisance cases probably as good as we have done them in a long, long time. But we are getting to that place to where if, if we're going to do more of it, we may have to look at what, what that looks like uh, for, for, the, for the police department and, and code enforcement. That's uh, especially for us in the nuisance side. Uh, but uh, those are very important for our community. Evidence. Uh, we collected over 3,600 pieces of evidence alone last year. I know you've seen some articles in the, uh, in the news topic. Uh, they turned me into Roger Rabbit with a cartoon uh, over the evidence room. But uh, we've got <laughs> over uh, 39,000 pieces of evidence in our evidence room. Um, that, was, that number was captured at the end of December. Uh, some of that increase uh, we directly relate to our digital media. Uh, our body cameras that we instituted several years ago. Uh, you know, you went from, if we have an incident and five officers show up, there's gonna be five uh, pieces of evidence just from the video alone, not to mention collecting, collecting evidence. So uh, we're, we're working on, uh, uh, on processing that and looking for ways to do that more efficiently and faster. Criminal charges over 42, 100 felony and misdemeanor charges, over 402 drug-related charges, over 80 alcohol-related charges. Our traffic, uh, we saw a, overall a 4% increase in our traffic crashes last year. Our property damage crashes were slightly over 1,000, and our uh, personal injury crashes were 147. We had a spike in our fatalities last year we had five incidents uh, that unfortunately resulted in, in six deaths. Uh, as we looked at those, some of those are, are things that we think we can look into. Some of those incidents are hard for us to address. Uh, one of those was had to deal with a tree during a storm. Uh, and, and from a police department stance, that is, uh, that's, that's hard to try to put things in place to manage. But uh, obviously, we, uh, we're focusing on that. Uh, our, the area that we have the most accidents uh, consistently is on Highway 321. Uh, that's the area that we focus most of our speed enforcement on, uh, especially in that congested area from the crossroads uh, up past Excella. Um, and our, our reasoning for that is trying to slow people down before they get into that uh, congested area. Uh, and, uh, and so you obviously see some of that out there. Um, that's our reasoning for that. Chief, are you taking yes. questions? You'll wait till it, it's, I can take them now or we can do it at the end. Go ahead. On your accidents, I'm curious to know if, if you can extract how much of those accidents are related to distracted driving claims. There, we, uh, there's a block on the accident report that uh, is called inattention. Mm -hmm. And that is typically the highest contributing factor every year on our accidents. Um, the problem with the distracted driving is some of that is hard for us to prove at the time of the accident scene investigation. Uh, if somebody doesn't say, I was on my cell phone or I was, uh, if they, you know, a lot of times I say, I look down for a second when I look back up, um, you know, and we, we think they may have been on the phone and it gets tagged as inattention. Do we um, enforce if we see someone that's on we, the cell phone? We, we do. Um, that, that's not a charge that we charge often. Um, but you can. But, but we can. 
and, and we have had officers that stopped folks and wrote uh, citations and, and wanted citations. The, the, the hurdle for that is in North Carolina, it's texting. And so to be able to do that, you, you almost have to see them manipulating the phone. And uh, there's some, some legislation uh, in the House uh, in the Senate to look at changing some of that. I know some states don't allow you to have a phone in any way in, in your hand. You have to have a total phone-free device. And, and that may change for North Carolina, but, but we'll see. Thank you. Um, other things, uh, we recovered over nine, 905,000 uh, items of stolen property last year. A big part of that was the recovered motor vehicles that, that we did recover. Uh, we had over 130,000 in, in drugs uh, that was seized a street level amount and over 20,000 in just cash and property from, from drugs. Other, other investigations, and these are things that get a lot of attention uh, in our community and, and nationwide. Uh, we had 32 drug overdoses uh, this past year, uh, total 38 deaths. Now some of those were medically attended, uh, six of, of the 38 uh, were directly related to overdoses, uh, which is a very sad statistic uh, because that's three more than we had in 17. In that's, 17, that we had be my question. What, yep. what do these numbers compare to last year? Yep. Uh, that, that is an increase uh, from uh, as far as the deaths uh, from 2017. What about the overdoses? The overdoses actually are down. Overdoses were 38, uh, and it's down to 32. Uh, the naloxone, you know, that's a product we began to use several years ago, um, three to four years ago. Uh, we had nine saves uh, with that. That's nine individuals that when our officers showed up, uh, they were blue or not breathing uh, and administering that uh, drug uh, was able to bring them back and get them stable uh, until medical personnel could arrive and, and, and give the treatment that they needed. Um, you see 15 uses. Several of those folks uh, we use two and three doses on uh, to be able to, uh, to bring them back. Um, and that is a, a, a change. When we began to talk about that several years ago, you know, that was something that was viewed from a law enforcement standpoint of, I don't know that that's law enforcement's role. That's a medical role. That's not. And the more we looked into it, um, if we administer it, uh, it, there's no side effects. It won't hurt anybody. And so we, along with other law enforcement agencies across the nation, have decided to, to do that, and, and it is paying off. Well, I mean, that, that would have been 15 deaths. I mean, if you, if you did, I mean, that's 15. The, total, that would have been a completely 15 total deaths if you guys had done that. It, nine, nine of the nine saves are the nine individuals. The 15 is a couple of those we use two and three doses on. Okay, I got so you. So nine so the uses as okay. I said, yes. Bam, bam. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yep. Uh, and, and that's a sad statistic. Um, and and the hard part for us that we see is at times we we've seen it several times where we administer that we bring somebody back uh, and they get stable and they don't want to go to the hospital, they don't want to go get treatment. Um, that they just want to go continue doing what they were doing. Uh, and uh, we, we have had parents of young 20 year olds uh, almost plead with us, please, please arrest my child. Because if you put them in jail tonight, I know they're going to be alive uh, and they're not going to go and, and continue that. And so that's a, it is a sad thing that, uh, that we're working on. But uh, unfortunately, it's not a, a city of Lenore only problem. Law enforcement across the nation is, is dealing with it. Chief, yes, sir. The police's role if a person refused to have additional medical attention, what would be your role at that point? If there is not a criminal, and, and that happens, if there is not a criminal charge that uh, that we can charge them with, um, they're 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 released. We document our involvement, uh, but there have been uh, several people that uh, they sign a a waiver for the medical uh, folks that show up for EMS that they don't want treatment and they're free to go unless there's some sort of criminal issue that we're involved in, and it, and it is sad. Mm -hmm. 21 backgrounds, that's sworn and non-sworn. Uh, we did 16 uh, ABC permits. 
throughout the city. Uh, we had 491 Crime Stoppers tips. Uh, that's the most we've had in about the last six years. Uh, that's a, a program that started in 1976 nationwide. We began uh, using Crime Stoppers here in Lenore in 1983, and uh, it's a program that the Lenore Police Department has run since its inception here, and, uh, and, and it works. We get a lot of information through that program. Uh, Detective Green did 11 polygraphs. Most of those are pre-employment, but some uh, concerning cases. Use of force. Uh, last year, we had 56 incidents of use of force. And when you think about 56, that number, think, wow, 56 times we'll use force on somebody. A couple of things I want to bring to your attention there, how we document our use of force, there's a couple of things in there. That is not every time us striking somebody or using hands on somebody. Uh, if, if we point a weapon at somebody to gain compliance, that is a use of force. Uh, and so there are times where we may have to point a weapon at somebody, uh, give them commands, they comply, handcuffs are put on them, uh, and that is the extent of the force. Are the they all lethal weapons? Sir? Are they all lethal weapons? Well, we, we also use tasers, uh, which are a non-lethal uh, type device, uh, and those are documented in, in there as well. Um, another thing to think about with that 56 incidents, think about the 31,000 police calls for service, uh, police interaction. Over 31,000 times our officers in some fashion interacted with the public. And out of those 31,000 times, only 56 incidents, we had to use some type of force. Uh, percentage wise, that uh, I, I'm proud of that percentage uh, for, for our officers. But it is something that, that we track, we keep up with, uh, and we should. and. Uh, Long after I'm gone as the chief, future chiefs uh, and supervisors should track it and keep up with it and, and monitor it. Our extra duty, uh, these are projects that our officers are paid by uh, another individual. Uh, the fairgrounds, the civic center, uh, somebody wanting uh, a uniform and a patrol car for private security. 473 projects, over 3,200 3, man hours. That's equals out to about one and a half full-time employees. Uh, and those numbers do not count the city-funded or city-sponsored events. Fourth of July, Christmas parade, barbecue festival, um, gravity games, the big events that the city puts on, that those numbers are not in there. And some of those events are, uh, we do track those as far as hours and what it costs uh, in, in salaries and manpower, uh, just so we know. but. Uh, there are a lot of extra things that our, our guys are uh, tasked with doing. Departmental training, we had over 11,000 hours of structured training. One of the things that when I came to Lenore in 96, some of the officers that I knew in surrounding counties said of uh, the city of Lenore and the Lenore Police Department, they will train you very well. And that is an area that I think over the years we have done a good job in and, and we're we will continue to do a good job in trying to get our guys specialized training along with the mandated training. One of the things that, that we talk about with our supervision team uh, is, you know, we want to train our people and prepare them so they're equipped to leave. But then we want to treat them good enough that they want to stay. Um, and the, I don't think we have ever done it, but the thought process of, well, we don't want to train them to the point to where they can leave, um, if you don't train them and they stay, what, if, what kind of product do you have? And so uh, thankfully, I don't think we have ever operated that way, but uh, it is very important for the training and, uh, and we're working real hard on the other side. Uh, and, uh, and the city overall uh, is working hard to, uh, to keep that retention along with uh, all the other departments nationwide with retaining their officers. Some of the things we're involved in, uh, a lot of different things our guys are involved in. The Robin's Nest Shelter Home, uh, Take 25, Explorers, Coffee with a Cop, just a lot of the different programs uh, that, that we do. Uh, just one of our uh, 
uh, posters that we put up. Uh, folks are watching this online. Uh, we obviously want anybody interested to, to come put an application in with us. A few other things that we're working on, we've just switched over from the UCR reporting to NIBRS, which is the National Incident Based Reporting System. That will change some of how our data looks uh, next year. Uh, that is a nationwide push for all law enforcement. North Carolina was supposed to be switched over by January of this year. We were. Uh, the state has not quite caught up and is not ready for agencies to begin reporting uh, to them. They're saying hopefully any month, but we're at the place to where we can report to them uh, when, when they're ready. Our evidence room, the intake, uh, we, we're looking at ways to, uh, to continue to make that more efficient, uh, to work on the backlog along with working on the intake. I think we've talked about that, uh, but that is a focus uh, of us going on this year. Looking at some off-duty software to help track and maintain some of the, uh, the off-duty assignments uh, and make streamline that process a little bit. Uh, right now, uh, a captain, uh, somebody calls or emails him, he posts that on a board and guys sign up and so we're looking at some software that, that will make that a, a little faster process and uh, track and take care of some of those reports that, that we keep up with. Our alarm ordinance, uh, Chief Brown implemented along with, with the council back in 2017, uh, at the end of 2017, uh, we, we slowed that down in trying to get ready for NIBRS and uh, the company we were using last year or looking at using last year uh, ended up getting bought out and that slowed us down some, uh, but we're picking speed back up with that. We have picked up with another company uh, and hopefully within the next coming months, uh, I would love for us to push it out uh, in uh, July 1, but that'll, that'll be a big uh, educating the community on what that'll be and operating that out of our, out of our ordinance. And then a policy review by our leadership team. Just one of those things that you have to do as agencies uh, continue to review policies uh, on, a, uh, on a yearly basis, but just some of the things. Once again, there's our report. Questions that any of you guys have? I know there's a lot to do this evening. And I don't want to take up extra time, but what are questions that I can answer at this point? Anyone have any questions for Chief Phelps? Good, Great Good job. Thank it you. Was a great always. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it, Chief. <laughs> we could, uh, before you go, would you consider one of those dance moves? <laughs> <laughs> City manager put me up to that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We would like to announce to everyone that he has talked about the Robin's Nest. Uh, Chief Phelps, uh, the Robin's Nest. Uh, uh, fundraiser is coming up in April, uh, April 13th, and they have what they call uh, Dancing with the Stars, Swing into Spring, and Chief Phelps and his lovely bride are two of the guest dancers yes. for that uh, this year. And uh, they have been on Facebook, if you haven't seen it, uh, several times. It's really great. You need to look that up and check out the dance moves and the and the sunglasses still that he did. Uh, I am not excited about the dance. <laughs> <laughs> it, is it is for a great cause. And that is uh, April 13th. Thank you for doing that in the community. Appreciate you being involved. Chief serves on the Robin's Nest Board of Directors and a uh, wonderful agency that we are so glad we have here. We wish we didn't have to have it by all means, but we do. And thank goodness that we have uh, that uh, abilities to take care of those situations when that does come come about so thank you for what you're doing there and everybody get a chance give him a little money he needs it badly I tell you. <laughs> okay we will move on then uh, we do not have any matters scheduled tonight for public hearing uh, we will have uh, uh, one in a few minutes that's coming up from uh, held over from our last meeting but, but before that we do uh, we'll move on then to our consent agenda items Tonight, consisting of minutes of the uh, City Council meeting of Tuesday, March 19, <coughs> 2019. Item B is the uh, change order number three. This is for the water treatment plant. The recommendation is approval of change order number three as recommended by the McGill Associates for the 
water treatment plant improvements project to reflect a net deduction in the contract amount of $82,280.15. Item C is a resolution for the general records retention and disposition schedule. Uh, this will be approval of a resolution adopting the updates to the general retention disposition schedule as requested by the North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources. So that is our three uh, consent agenda items. If there's anyone you'd like to discuss, or if not, we would need a motion on those. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to present a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I have a motion from Council Member Stevens to uh, approve the consent agenda items A, B, and C as presented. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed. Thank you. That carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on then. It's now a time on our agenda for uh, if there's any requests or petitions of any citizens, if there's anyone who would like to address the council this evening concerning any issues, now is the time to do so. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no one, we'll move on. We do not have any reports of our boards and commissions this evening, so we'll move on to the report and recommendations of the city manager, Mr. Hildebrand. Mayor, Council, a couple items for your information this evening. Um, this Saturday, April 6th at 4 o'clock will be a downtown cruising <coughs> event. Uh, the City County Service Committee will meet on Monday, April 8th at 1145 at the uh, Community College. The uh, Caldwell County EDC will meet on Tuesday, April 9th, 8 a.m., and that'll be held at the uh, Civic Center. The Tourism Development Authority will meet on Thursday, April 11th at 4 o'clock, and that'll be third floor City Hall. The Lenore Business Advisory Board will meet Thursday, April 11th. That'll be at 6 o'clock, 3rd Floor City Hall. Uh, also, the North Carolina Gravity Games, sponsored by Google, will be held on Saturday, April 13th, from 9.30 a.m. to 3 o'clock, and that'll be held in downtown Lenore. And I don't know if Ms. Horn wants to mention anything about that or not. If so, we'll... Cool. We'll have folks from all over the state at that event, maybe some out of state as well. Uh, the ABC board will meet on Tuesday, April 16th at 2 o'clock, and that's going to be held at store number one. And then the Mayor's Prayer Breakfast, in conjunction with National Day of Prayer, will be held on Thursday, May 2nd at North <coughs> Presbyterian Church, and that's located on Kirkwood Street. Tickets are $10, and are available at City Hall. Scott, Scott, real quick, Caldwell's hiring, April 17th, uh, for those who are interested in jobs, uh, or if you're an employer looking for and uh, putting out employers, we do this in the fall and the spring. That is going to be April 17th at the... Uh, Six Center. Okay. All right. Thank you. You want me to do it next? And the item for your action tonight will be the conditional use permit that you received um, last meeting. And do you want me to read the conditions, or you want to read the conditions, or Which, whichever way you want to do it? <laughs> You're good at it. <laughs> oh, I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, we will. This is, of course, a quasi-judicial uh, hearing as. Um, was, was held on Tuesday, March 19th of 2019, and for our council to consider a conditional use permit was submitted by the MC Morgan and, Com and Associates Incorporated. This is for property located at 316 Lower Creek Drive. Uh, this item was tabled for council action until the city council meeting of tonight, Tuesday, April 2nd, in order to allow the council additional time to review the application. Since it is a quasi-judicial hearing, council felt like we needed more time in which to uh, look into the situation and, and learn more about the whole process and make sure that we're doing everything possible uh, in the protection uh, of the neighborhood and everyone concerned in this in this uh, process. Uh, the request is for property located between Tywood Street and Eastover Circle, that being North Carolina PIN number 275-948-8961 and North Carolina PIN number 275-948-8577. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit for a 68 unit apartment complex located in the R9 and B2 zoning districts. The staff is recommending approval subject to the following conditions. Those being the development shall substantially comply with the site plan on page eight of the staff report, inclusive of staff's, staff's additional notes and clarifications. The maximum number of units shall be 68. The sidewalk along Royal Creek Drive will be eight feet wide and straightened for accessibility. A pedestrian connection must be provided from the sidewalks along Royal Creek Drive to the internal pedestrian network. The smaller parcel, uh, which is 275 
577 will be recombined with a larger track, which is 275 948 8961, in compliance with the City of Honor zoning and subdivision regulations prior to permitting. The vegetative buffer will be a minimum of 20 feet wide along the northwestern side north property lines where adjacent to single family residential properties. The architectural standards for the articulation through, through the provision of architectural features as well as the standards for materials and parking lot landscaping found in section 714 of the zoning ordinance shall apply to the entire site, not just the B2 zone portions. Primary facade shall be uh, any facade that is visible from Lower Creek Drive or adjacent residential properties. Dumpsters shall be screened on all sides with dumpster enclosures finished to match the principal buildings. All lighting shall be fully cut off and shielded so as to eliminate minimized light spillover onto adjacent residential properties. Signage on Lower Creek Drive shall use exterior illumination only, no internal illumination. Exterior lighting shall be directed at the sign face and be fully shielded to prevent light spillover onto neighboring residential properties. <clears throat> Valid permits must be obtained for this pr project and for construction must meet the requirements of the City of Lenore Code of Ordinances, the North Carolina State Building Code, the North Carolina State Fire Code, and any other federal, state, or local regulation that applies. And the last, if a building permit has not been issued within 24 months of the adoption of the conditional use permit, the approval shall be considered null and void. Those are the conditions that are uh, at, at right now that are placed on it. The uh, public hearing certainly was closed at the March 19th uh, meeting, so it's now uh, now ready for the council for discussion. Mr. Rohr, our city attorney, I would like to call on you to give us uh, some updates on the uh, quasi-judicial. Thank right. you. So um, based on some of the issues that were raised at the last meeting, <coughs> I went ahead and pulled uh, what's referred in the um, application and in the announcement about Section 9, Article 9 of the uh, City Code, City Code of Ordinances, Special Review Procedures for Conditional Uses. And I wanted to cover some of the highlights of that. And then also uh, did some legal research on a couple of uh, cases from 2020 and 2018 involving the city of Asheville and the town of Garner on some unconditional use permit uh, cases they had. So um, <clears throat> the purpose of a conditional use permit is to assure that the proposed use and its location will be harmonious with the area in which it is proposed to be located and with the spirit of the ordinance and to ensure that the proposed use will not be detrimental to surrounding environment and property values. Uh, your, code, your code of ordinances specifically says that when deciding conditional use permits, the city council or planning board shall follow quasi-judicial procedures. And so uh, I'll go into some of the specifics like I did last time and as you followed, as you did follow last time, what the specifics of that require. Not just the procedures of the hearing, but in terms of how you're to consider the, uh, the evidence that's brought before you. Uh, as um, the, as the, um, both the planning board and the staff provided, uh, there are basically one, two, three, eight different issues that you're to consider in determining whether a conditional use should be approved, a conditional use permit should be approved. And those are the, the uh, conditional use will com comply with all height, yard, lot, and area requirements. Driveways will be designed with respect to such matters. And actually, uh, rather than reading those, I'll simply refer you to pages five and six of the staff report, which they set out there um, the eight issues that uh, the no conditional use permit shall be approved unless the planning board and city council find that, and it sets those out. You heard evidence on that two weeks ago. <clears throat> so talking about a, a conditional use permits and how you're to receive evidence on that. <coughs> It is in the nature uh, quasi-judicial in terms of you receive sworn evidence, and that's the only evidence you're supposed to consider. Um, <clears throat> let's see. 
Council members sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity must base their decision to grant or deny a permit on object objective factors which are based upon the evidence presented and not upon their subjective preferences or ideas. A city council may not deny a conditional use permit in their unguided discretion or because in their view it would adversely affect the public interest. In quasi-judicial proceedings, no board or council member should appear to be an advocate for nor adopt an adversarial position to a party, bring in extraneous or incompetent evidence, or rely upon ex parte communications when making their decision. And I've advised you about that, that you've known that as long as you've been on council when we've talked about that. You're not to investigate the property on your own. You're not to talk to people outside this body. Uh, you're not to talk to people outside this meeting, so you shouldn't have talked about it among each other in the two weeks that we've been there. You, you're allowed to consider the evidence that had been presented to you, whether it was re-watching the video, looking at the minutes of the meeting. That's the evidence that's presented to you, and that's the only thing you're supposed to consider. Um, <clears throat> you have a requirement to be neutral and to, and to appear neutral. They're equ those are equally critical in maintaining the integrity of the judicial and quasi-judicial processes. It's a judicial proceeding and not a legislative function. The legislative and policy decision of whether to allow, in this case, an apartment complex in this zoning district has already been made by the city council when it adopted the ordinance. When, you d when this council determined that a, an apartment complex, if it meets the requirements of a conditional use permit, if it meets those requirements, you are legally required to approve it. If it doesn't meet the requirements, you can deny it, or you are legally required to deny it if it, meets the, if it fails to meet those. In addition, uh, the, uh, if the application that's before you is complete and complied with all the applicable requirements of the ordinance, then it's on you to consider, as you did, the evidence before you. And so, as we explained before, uh, you're not to advocate for one side or the other. You're not to be against one side or the other, except as the evidence persuades you to do so. Uh, if, the party, if, if a party is put on what they call a prima facie evidence, if they've met the requirements of the, uh, ordin of the uh, permit, then it's on the opponents to present evidence that refutes that. And um, <clears throat> the case from the town of Garner talks about uh, you have to have substantial evidence such that a reasonable mind could accept it as adequate to support a conclusion. Um, a case says, opinions by residents of the area that the value of neighboring property would be adversely affected by the project, insofar as they are conclusions unsupported by factual data or background, are incompetent and insufficient to justify the, the quasi-judicial body's findings. Uh, <clears throat> And so that's basically the law on it, that this isn't a legislative decision. You're acting much as a judge does in hearing evidence. And that's how you're to be guided in making your decision in the case. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Rohr before we move forward? Uh, because I was absent, um, if you don't mind, um, <coughs> TJ telling us about telling me how I what my role in, in this will be knowing that I, I have gone through I've read the minutes I understand what's going on I haven't talked to anybody um, so can you explain where or how I fall into this place now knowing that this has been pushed to this point initially I my thought was that you would not be able to uh, vote on this that you weren't present you didn't hear the evidence you weren't able to judge the credibility of the witnesses but I did call the school of government and they told me that that was the, that they said that that would seem to be your initial reaction, but they referred me to some cases that I did pull, including going all the way back to 1963, where just because the makeup of the body has changed between one meeting and another, as long as the new members have had an adequate opportunity to review the record and make their own independent determination, that just like you are, just like any other uh, vote, if you're present, you must vote. Um, uh, this is a 2016 case involving Lincoln County. And actually, uh, the, one of the parties in that case was Gary Dellinger, who used to be a uh, judge, Judge Gary Dellinger. He was an owner of property and applied for a permit. Or actually, I think he was opposing the permit. 
the, uh, the court said the change in board membership composition had no effect upon petitioners or the opposing party's ability to present its arguments in favor of issuance of the conditional permit. Um, both new board members, in that case it was two, new, uh, two board members that weren't present at the other time, had an opportunity to read and, and review all of the evidence previously considered. Commissioner Oaks stated he reviewed the entire record of the prior proceedings before participating in the March 16th vote. Petitioners have failed to show any prejudice by new Commissioner Oaks' participation in the hearing and vote. So uh, initially my, rea my belief was that you couldn't vote, but I believe now that since you have indicated on the record that you reviewed the record, you've reviewed the minutes, yeah. that you uh, can participate and should vote. Okay. I'm perfectly fine with that. Okay. <clears throat> That's good. Yeah, I just okay. wanted to be clear because there, there, there had been an email about the, this conversation. I wanted it to be apparent to everybody so everybody knows what, what's going on with me. Exactly. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Attorney. Okay, then um, we will uh, go to council for discussion on this. Uh, from our, our meeting of March 19, there were three issues that were brought to us to, uh, to that were of, of some uh, worry. One was the location of the driveway coming out of the property onto Laurel Creek Drive. Second one was the 60-foot uh, setback of the uh, buildings um, and their potential uh, of being one-story, two-story situation. And third was the uh, traffic control of traffic going on to Floor Creek Drive. Uh, the feeling uh, we feel like was that the traffic we would like to encourage <coughs> and traffic to go out onto Highway 18. Now, I will open it up to any discussion of the council uh, as to if they have uh, feelings toward those issues uh, as we look toward and the other things that we have on there. Oh, it's permissible for us to ask questions of Jenny? The clarification, correct? Yeah, I believe you can ask her, her for clarification, okay. yes. Okay. And she was sworn during that time, so that uh, she would need to be sworn in again. Uh, okay. it's been, it, there's been enough uh, time that's elapsed. Uh, thank you. Okay, but be sworn again. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I do. I'd also point out that uh, the uh, parties that were present last time, I see several of them are here again. They would be they would be allowed to ask her some follow up questions as well if they want to, since it, it is in the nature of a judicial quasi judicial proceeding. Right. The parties have a chance to uh, ask questions if they want to follow up on any questions you may have. But we're not taking any more testimony; just right. asking questions. Right. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. My my question of Jenny involves what the mayor referenced on that 60-foot buffer. Mm -hmm. um, have you had any chance to, to look at that uh, or, or do any research on, on that requirement, if it would end up being a requirement? That came up, and I'd, I'd love to know if you've had any thoughts on that. But, yes. Um, I, so I haven't looked at any new site plan. No new information right. has been submitted to me. Um, obviously, we review off of a conceptual site plan, but... When I went back to look at it and I did have a conversation with the developer to clarify what I was looking at, because of the grade of the site, the grade is going to drive the final placement of those buildings, which is sort of why there's not setbacks called out on here. So um, today, looking at the conceptual plan, they are not set back 60 feet. Right. Um, I think that if you were to make a requirement that it be set back 60 feet, you could actually end up causing some issues with the site plan as far as the grading. Like if we really like the split level with one story and two story, I think that you're going to want to try to give some flexibility to where that actual placement is because the topo hasn't been done yet. Like the civil hasn't been done for the grading. So they're, um, they're essentially chasing grade back on the site for where each building has to sit to avoid having to build up retaining walls on the, the front side. But again, can you confirm to me what the minimum setback is by ordinance? I, I, I know I've got that written down in some notes, but... 
what paper I had. I don't have. In I'm front sorry for stuff you that. Yeah. It was in the minutes. Okay. I want to say it's 35 feet, but I just don't remember. All right. I don't think I even had it on here because it was, um, we normally don't look at something that specific. Okay. Whatever I said in the minutes was correct because I did review <laughs> okay. those with the clerk. I think I said 35 or 40, and then I clarified it 35. 35 foot, I found it in the minutes, and it's. Yeah, and I recall reading that mm -hmm. now. So 35 foot front setback in R9 will be applied at the time of permitting. Um, mm -hmm. Council could make a condition change it to 60 feet. But if I hear what you're saying, it, it may end up making the visual change. effect yeah. might end up making it worse than than it appears at 35. Is it, yep. I'm yep. not trying to put, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is no, it? That, but that, that would be how I would look at it too. I think, um, you know, requiring a 40 foot versus a 35 feet five foot would that make that big of a difference but almost double at 60 feet then because of how the grade goes if you have to meet that setback then there may be some grading in front that has to happen to be able to preserve split level buildings which would basically put a retaining wall in front of like between the building and the street which is not typically what we want to see because it tends to then make the if okay. you're if you're going to fill up, it can make it look taller. So, okay, that's all I've got I right mean, now. The goal was to keep it as low as mm -hmm. visibly as low as you could. Right. If it's sixty one feet. story versus two story, right. if it's sixty feet, you're possibly going to both stories will be visible. If it's at forty or say that one story will be visible. Well, no, the building will be the same building no matter how you, exactly. you do it. Um, it's not like one will be hot. The roof line would be the same. It's if you have to get back 60 feet, but they're going to have to grade way out to where the front wouldn't be at the front, they may have to do something where they kind of, it, it, you'll end up with sort of a retaining wall <coughs> between the buildings. It's just really not a desirable. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Council? Anyone in the audience who would like to address a question to Jenny pertaining to that? Okay. Thank you. Jenny, is it is it possible that, and I don't know if this is your question, but uh, is it possible that we can put some traffic calming features in on the Lower Creek side? of the project, if nothing else, to um, encourage use out the rear side to 18. Like a rumble strip or a speed rumble hump strips or something or, like uh, that. Speed hump, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, I think that's certainly um, feasible. One thing this site plan does that would be the other suggestion for traffic calming is you don't necessarily want a straight shot right through. Right. It doesn't provide that. You kind of have to make a turn to go around. But okay. uh, I mean, that would all be within the realm of feasibility. There wouldn't be a code reason you couldn't okay. require that on, on the private property. We wouldn't want to put it on a, the public property. On the right. on lower, we wouldn't want to put it in lower Creek drive. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone? If not, we uh, council. Yes. Up to you for motion, discussion, whatever you. Unless you have any other comments. Based on so based on the evidence presented and as long as the requirements are met, um, I feel that I would like to move forward with a recommendation to go forward with the um, um, what's the word the um, conditional use conditional use permit as presented. Uh, can we ask you one yes. question here as part of that? But so the, this with is the, conversation. Would you yes. consider the traffic calming um, speed hump? Right. I would let the 
department plan for what would be the best fit there. So with Laurel that, Creek if side. there are opportunities to uh, connect some uh, traffic calming components to this, I would like to make that as part of the recommendation because I think that's would be helpful. Will you consider as your, in, in addition to your motion, and this will require some discussion between Jenny and, and Mr. Morgan, of that setback line, he's at a minimum of 35 feet, but to consider going as far back as possible so that you, to a point where it does become a problem with the integrity of the slope. Does that make sense? 35 is your minimum requirement. We spoke of 60. We're hearing now that 60 might actually provide a different result than what the 60-foot setback was intended. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to have the setback as far back as possible without mm -hmm. creating any additional <clears throat> problems with the view. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. it does. I, How do you work that? Yeah. So can you, can you address my concern there? Yeah, I guess that from from staff perspective, I need something that would yeah. be sort of a hard standard to review against. So maybe just say that it would be meeting the minimum 35 foot setback plus any additional setback that is able to be achieved without having to put a retaining wall in. Is, Something is, is like it that. possible that that community center might, would, if you push it back, it gets awfully close to that parking lot then, I guess. That was another thing I, I thought of. All right, I'll. I'll so you could, can we put in there a minimum of 30, Well, it's say, it already says a minimum, minimum of 35, 35 feet, right? right? It already says that. And, and, and he agreed last time at, at, per the minutes that, that he would be willing to go back, but I don't want to do that if it's going to create a, a problem with the view as from a one story to a two. Right. So I, I guess we'll just have to leave it up to, to how the, the land allows, but a minimum of 35 is, is, is what, what he'll be bound to if, if it's approved. Um, yes, sir. As, as I understand from the, the city attorney, and I appreciate you educating us, educating the public. Um, Personal preference has no part in this vote on any of our parts, and we know that. Decisions have to be based on, on fact and, and not emotion. Um, they have to be based on fact and, and not opinion. Um, whether I like the project or not is, is irrelevant. Uh, we're all called on doing what, what we were sworn to do when we took this oath to, to do this. We have to consider, is it zoned for this? And yes, it is. Does the owner have a right to develop it? Yes, they do. Um, that's the easiest part of this consideration. Um, whether we think there's a saturation of this type of housing in certain areas within the city or we want market rate housing as opposed to other types of housing, um, we can't base our decisions on that. Um, we have to have evidence to the contrary of what our, of what our professionals, our, our uh, expert witnesses, if, if, if we're acting as judges, then, then Jenny is, our, is this council's expert witness. And we have to rely on, on the evidence that we've been given, and only that evidence, as is consistent with Mr. Rohr's statement, to, to make the decision. And so we can beat this all day long that we don't like this type of proceedings, but it's what we're, what we're faced with. And so I just wanted to, to, make, to make those comments to, to, to reinforce what, what our position is here and how we make this decision. Thank you for those comments, yep. Mr. Purdue. Okay, we're back to your motion, uh, Councilmember Thomas, that um, this uh, you're recommending that we uh, uh, move forward to approve the conditional use permit with the conditions as presented and adding the condition of a traffic calming effect, um, whether that be whatever is would be properly done toward Laurel Creek Drive. The 35 feet is already in there, and certainly we are saying that we would like to have that <laughs> as much as possible, uh, but we also understand the, the, look, the look of the thing. Is there anything else to be added to this motion or considered? If not, Council, you have a motion from Council. One, one thing I would mention yes, is sir. that I think the motion need, would need to include adopting the proposed findings of fact, unless you have some reason not to adopt the proposed findings of fact that staff recommended. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. That would be included into the motion. That would be included in the motion. Okay. Yeah, those would be from pages five and six 
uh, five to the top of six staff report. Okay. Okay, the motion is on the floor from Councilmember Thomas that we approve the um, conditional use permit as presented with the conditions and the added ones that we just did tonight. Is there any other discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. That carries unanimously. We appreciate that. Thank you all for being with us and for letting us have another two weeks at least to look into it. Appreciate that very much. Okay. We're back. We're still under the uh, city manager's uh, staff report. We have a we have something from the city manager still. Just want to mention to you, I handed out a map to you earlier this evening. Um, recently, uh, Joel Kincaid was working to consolidate two parcels of property owns on Main Street. And during the survey process, he discovered a small portion of the sidewalk at J. Broyle Park may be encroaching on his property. And as a resolution, he suggested we go back and look at a land swap for a 0.1 acre to a 0.1 acre uh, swap. And it's an A and B on the map there. You can see that. If council's okay with that, we'll proceed with bringing that to you next meeting and doing the proper advertisement legal notice for that. So just want to bring that for the record. So we don't need to call for a hearing or anything? Uh, it doesn't require a hearing, okay. just a public notice that we do that. So. Okay. Yeah, I have no problem with that. Okay. No, I think that makes sense. Consensus is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bring that forward. We'll, we'll bring that next meeting then. Thank you. Next meeting. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. City Manager? That's all I have. All right. We'll move on then to a report from our city attorney. Mr. Rohr, do you have anything else? No. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, I will announce that we do have we have some, a list of individuals I will be bringing to you later for reappointment uh, uh, at this point, maybe appointment or reappointment to the city's authorities and boards. I will be contacting that list and uh, to find out if they are uh, would like to continue serving on that and I will bring that report to you at the next uh, meeting on that. Is there any other report from our uh, city council members to come up? Nothing? Good. All right. If nothing else to come before us, we stand adjourned.